I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Publishers Desk podcast. My name is Pier Paolo Finaldi, and I'm the CEO and publisher of the Catholic Truth Society, a publisher which has been serving the Catholic community in the UK and abroad for over 150 years. We've published everything from prayer cards to booklets to leather bound liturgical volumes, and everything in between, and have published great Catholic authors, including Cardinal Newman. Ronald Knox, G.K. Chesterton, and many others. Today, I'm very happy to be speaking to another in this long line of distinguished authors, Father Lawrence Liu, author of one of our latest releases, The Mysteries Made Visible, Praying the Rosary with Sacred Art. Father Liu is a Dominican friar and serves as prior of the, and parish priest uh, and rector at the shrine, at the Rosary Shrine at the Priory Church of Our Lady of the Rosary in St. Dominic in Haverstock Hill, London. Father Lawrence is currently appointed to the General Curia of the Dominican Order as the Promoter General for the Holy Rosary. He's an avid photographer and his uh, images can be uh, found on book covers, magazines, and in all kinds of online publications as well. So welcome, Father Lawrence. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So um, if we can start um, so by um, saying something about um, yourself, um, you um, weren't always a Dominican. In fact, you weren't always um, even a Catholic. So do you want to tell us a bit about your, your faith journey? Yes. Um, well, I was born into a, a good Protestant family, uh, sort of, you know, Bible loving, um, Jesus believing family. I've always had Jesus in my life. Um, and going to church was a very uh, austere experience for me. Um, I used to dread going to church in a way as a child because it was a two, two hour, two and a half hour sort of ordeal. Um, and as you get older, you know, and get more restless, it becomes more difficult to concentrate. There was nothing to look at because the whole church was basically a whitewashed uh, square room. Um, and over the stage uh, were the words of scripture. Uh, quite a Protestant phrase, actually, there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Um, so just to be sure, there's no other mediators such as Mary and the saints. Um, and that's the kind of atmosphere I imbibed. I mean, what we did in church was sing hymns for about an hour, and then we listen to a sermon for an hour, uh, and then sing a few more hymns and off we go. There was no such thing as, uh, you know, remembrance of the Lord's Supper or anything like that. I don't remember any of that as a child. And I would spend a lot of my time in church, either playing with my toy cars, uh, looking at my picture Bible. And you see, I already loved pictures mm -hmm. then. Or looking uh, at the Bible itself and reading about liturgy in heaven. That was the thing that captured me, reading the book of Apocalypse and trying to imagine what worship in heaven was like. Um, and so, you know, God and the Holy Spirit is working in my heart, I think, to prepare me for uh, my encounter, my first encounter with Catholicism which happened uh, when I moved from Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia to Singapore. And I went to Singapore for my secondary school because my, uh, my father got a job in Singapore. Um, I didn't want to go. Uh, and I was uh, put in a Catholic boys' school run by De La Salle brothers, actually the oldest Catholic school in Singapore. And um, I was shocked to be put into a Catholic school because I had quite an anti-Catholic streak, unfortunately. Um, and I remember telling my classmates, this is in the first week, mind you, when they said they were Catholics, I said, oh, you know, you worship Mary and you're not real Christians. You're going to go to hell. <laughs> That's one way to make friends. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and, I mean, they were quite shocked and taken aback and they said, no, you're wrong. And I said, I said well, I'll show you. Uh, so I took myself off to the library in the school and I started uh, reading about what Catholics believed thinking that I would be able to show them that they were wrong. And as God would have it, I read myself into the Catholic Church. I discovered the richness and the cultural depth of Catholicism in all its 2000 year history. Uh, I discovered Catholic uh, music, Catholic art, um, slowly, um, and above all, Catholic liturgy. It was the liturgy that captured me. Uh, must have been going to mass and and just hearing the, 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 the voice of scripture coming through very richly in the liturgy, and then listening to uh, everybody singing the Holy Holy, the Sanctus. And I remembered 
you know, worship in heaven being like that from the book of Apocalypse. And so what I lo longed for as a child kind of uh, became reality in the Catholic Church and the Mass. And my longing as well for sacred art and sacred images to feed the imagination, something that was completely lacking in my background, suddenly came to the fore. And I think since then, I've always loved uh, sacred images and been fascinated by art in church. So the, the family, uh, your family sent you to the school in the sense they only, they only had themselves to blame oh, uh, yes. well, once you converted. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, my, my family, I mean, I was very lucky, you know, my, my mother and my father at that time were the least, uh, <laughs> the least observant of my family members, right? So my aunts and uncles were, you know, elders in church, they were, you know, very involved in church. My aunt, my, one of my aunts is a senior pastor of her own church. Um, my father hardly ever went to church and my mother hardly ever as well. And so, Consequently, they were a lot more easygoing and they thought it was good that I was going to church and at least not getting into trouble. So the rest of my family uh, did object actually to my becoming a Catholic, but my mother and my father didn't object and they were quite supportive. So, you know, again, all that is in God's mysterious providence. Indeed. So um, what, what brought you to your kind of other interest then, which is uh, photography, uh, which this book that we're talking about today kind of brings these these two great interests together. Um, well, what, what started did that off? Well, in fact, it was uh, the, one of the bishops of Leeds um, from 2000, Bishop David Constant. And we were going on a pilgrimage to Rome for World Youth Day. And I remember him uh, using this camera and it was a, a digital camera, something I'd never seen before, you know, and he showed us how you could take a photograph and you can see on the screen straight away. I was fascinated. You he was know. an early adopter. Oh, mm. absolutely. He was a very early ad adopter. And I was really impressed by this. Um, I'd gone along with my you know, traditional film camera, not because I had any great interest in art photography, you know, like, you know, like a young person, I guess I just want to take pictures of my friends, uh, pictures of us partying or whatever. And of course, a few pictures of Rome, first time in Rome is all very exciting. Mm. Um, I must have taken 12 rolls of film, or maybe even 15 rolls of film, 36 exposures each. Wow. I remember if you're lucky, you can Expensive get... Expensive business. You can get more than 36 if you're lucky. Yeah. Uh, it always seemed like a great, great thing if you could get 38 exposures out of that roll of 36. And uh, yes, it was very expensive to develop afterwards. And because I wasn't uh, in any way an expert, um, I was very disappointed with the results, right? So some photographs didn't come out well at all. In fact, I would say that 10% were really usable and the rest were just black. Um, I mean, it was a point and shoot camera, but when you've got really big churches and you, and you, you know, use your flash, that's a fatal error. You, all you get is you uh, illuminated dust modes in front of the, of the screen. Mm. Um, so that's what happened. Uh, I, I started thinking then about photography and thinking about digital cameras. And I asked my father uh, when I went back to Singapore that summer, if he would buy me a digital camera. It was a Sony digital camera. At that time, I was big into Sony. Anything Sony, I would buy. So I trusted them, and I bought a Sony camera. Did you, did and, you ever have a mini disc? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, yeah. It did, but this one didn't. It had a uh, like a really big kind of not SD card, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Cards. I remember, I can't like, remember yeah, what yeah. they're called. <clears throat> yeah, it, it was quite amazing. I mean, I have some of the photographs on my camp on my computer still, and you look at them, you think, "Gosh, that picture is so small. The resolution is so mm. poor." <laughs> and I had this camera, and I took it with me to the Philippines, where I did some work for a year as a lay volunteer with the Dominicans. I worked for Dominican Volunteers International. I was teaching the poor in the slums of Manila, and it was nice to have a camera again. It was a great pastoral tool, I thought, because the children loved looking at it and they were fascinated by seeing their own self in the screen. And, and so it was a great uh, icebreaker to have that camera. And I took many photographs that year. And during my year teaching the children, I realized that I could make PowerPoint presentations with um, photographs of the saints of the life of Christ to illustrate the PowerPoint stories I was telling. 
And that's how I became interested in the idea of using stained glass windows, because I thought to myself, how am I going to illustrate the parables and the life of the saints in a colorful, vibrant way? And of course, stained glass windows was uh, the, the easiest way I could think of. So I became quite fascinated with them. So when I finished my year in the Philippines, I think I upgraded my camera just before I entered the novitiate, which was in Cambridge. And I knew that Cambridge had, you know, many beautiful churches, many college chapels. And so I thought, yeah, this is a good hobby to have. Um, now that I don't have to pay to have the camera, uh, the photographs developed, um, it seemed a worthwhile hobby for a novice to have and uh, a poor friar, you know, he didn't have to spend anything else once he bought the camera. Famous last words. Because <laughs> we keep upgrading our cameras. Don't yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, it was a great um, tool for me to get out of the uh, priory just to encouraged me to explore the city of Cambridge to, to take photographs and, and to photograph a lot of stained glass windows. So at that time, my concentration was almost entirely in stained glass. It wasn't until I moved to Oxford after my simple profession um, that I managed to connect to people on Flickr. And Flickr was uh, then a great way of meeting other photographers. Flickr at that time was a real community of people who loved photography. Mm -hmm. And so by being on Flickr, I could look at other people's photographs. And that's where I began to learn to see things in a more artistic way, I suppose. I would look at a photograph and say, okay, what do I like about that? How can I try and emulate that photograph, something like that? And occasionally I'll drop people a message and say, how did you do that? What kind of lens did you use? And so on. And I, I was taught by friends that I met on Flickr um, how to use my camera better. Because until then, I would do everything using the, the auto exposure or the um, program exposure modes. And so a friend of mine called Martin Beek, uh, who lives in Oxford, um, took me out with him for one of his church crawls. And he showed me how to use the manual setting on my digital camera. And the great thing about that is that you can see the results of your um, adjustments straight away. I didn't have to wait to develop it and, and get those kind of disasters that I had when I went to Rome. And um, Martin also showed me um, how to look out for, you know, beautiful medieval artifacts in many of the great parish churches around our country and how to appreciate, um, you know, wall paintings, alabasters, uh, beautiful wood carved choir stalls and pew ends and so on and so forth. And that sort of helped me to expand the range of things I photographed from merely stained glass windows to all these other things. Stained glass is still a great love. Can you, your I favorite. Appreciate sacred art. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting because in a sense, um, digital photography and uh, especially, and stained glass have in common that it's all to do with light. Uh, yeah. In the sense, there's, you know, it's, it's, they, they, they seem to kind of fit together very well. Um, one question I, I, um, I had is, uh, I mean, you're obviously using your images um, early on in the Philippines as a, a catechetical tool, should we say, um, whereas I, obviously in this book that, that we're, we're, um, we're talking about today, um, the images be, become an aid to devotion. Um, so could you say something about the importance of, of images, the importance of art in, in our life of prayer? Hmm. Well, that's a wonderful phrase by St. Paul, where he speaks of our Lord as the image or really the icon of the unseen God. Um, and we know that St. John of Damascus uses that line from scripture to defend the use of sacred images and sacred art and so on. And, you know, coming from that an iconic background, a background where there were no sacred images in, in the church building where we worshipped at all, um, I craved, I longed for art and beauty that would engage the imagination and that would help us to, uh, to understand the scriptures better and to understand the life of Jesus and the saints. The sacred images, I think, uh, don't the uh, sacred art in church doesn't just act in itself. So a lot of modern, uh, probably going to be a bit critical now, but a lot of modern uh, church art is impressionistic. It, it sort of elicits your feelings. So it's abstract, there are no faces. 
and it's sometimes just creating light effects. Uh, in Cologne Cathedral, for example, there's a very famous window uh, created, I think, in the noughties um, of just, uh, well, what looks like pixels, little pixels of colored glass, you know, plain colored glass. And it's, it, it has beautiful light effects uh, when the sun shines through it, um, but it doesn't actually teach. Whereas I'm much more interested in the power of the sacred image to teach and indeed to act as a signpost to truth, to the eternal truths. So, you know, I, you have to understand the life of the saint so that you can look at a saint and say, oh, okay, that's St. Paul holding a sword. Why? Because that's the instrument of his martyrdom. Often you, you hear people say, oh, that's because St. Paul wrote about the, the Bible as the sword of the spirit. That's a typical Protestant interpretation. No, the Catholic interpretation is to always have a martyr hold the instrument of his martyrdom, right? So that's why he's holding a sword. And so understanding these elements of his life, of the life of the saints, can help us to understand the art and vice versa. The art helps us to understand what we're, uh, something about the life of the saints, something about the life of Christ. Um, so I think that um, I've always been curious about the artwork that we see in the church. And it acts as a stimulus for me to either read the scriptures or to read up about the saint. And so what I do on Flickr is um, I start to use the image, I put it up, and I have one put up every day to match the liturgy of the day. And then I encourage people to, to try and read um, the sacred image and understand more about Christ and the saints. So that's how I use it catechetically. And I think that that engagement of the imagination uh, as C.S. Lewis talks about it, is extremely important because the imagination using images helps us to bridge a, a lack of understanding from just words. You know, sometimes uh, the imagination uh, can actually help us to, to understand better. I think it's, it's interesting that um, so much uh, contemporary art um, seeks to always kind of elicit like a, a very a, a strong emotion um, you know, usually shock, I think, in, yeah. uh, in, in most stuff that we see at the moment, whereas um, a lot of the, the religious art of the past had, had quite a kind of functional um, uh, you know, function, I suppose. It, it existed to help people either to understand or to pray, uh, mm -hmm. and yet that didn't, in, because it wasn't art for art's sake, it had yeah. a function, and yet that didn't mean that it was, uh, uh, you know, that the, the church hasn't produced uh, great works of art, and I think uh, I think to to recapture that way of of looking at art and of using it in in the manner in which it was uh, intended to be used, I think is is a great kind of asset to uh, publications like the the one we're doing. I mean, how how do you in in your own life in your own life of prayer? How do you uh, how do you kind of use images, um, especially when uh, praying the rosary? I guess I can speak about um, this great church that you see behind me. This is, um, I'm, I'm floating in and out of it. Uh, <laughs> it's a virtual background, of course, and this is the Rosary Shrine in London, uh, which has uh, one chapel for every single mystery of the Rosary. It is the first church in the world to have that feature. We are familiar with it if you go to Lourdes or you go to um, Fatima, but both Lourdes and Fatima um, post-dated uh, are later than this church. Um, and I discovered that praying the rosary in front of these beautiful sculpted images, sculpted tableau for each of the mysteries of the rosary, I discovered that that engaged my imagination and helped me to concentrate and focus in a much deeper way. And that's why in the book that we're talking about, uh, Mysteries Made Visible, the first joyful mystery, the Annunciation, is uh, a photograph of the first Joyful Mystery Chapel here in the Rosary Shrine in London. And you can see then the sculpture, how beautiful it is, the way the stained glass falls across it and illuminates it. Um, and when you stand in front of these three-dimensional statues, it's almost as if you inhabit their space when you're standing in front of them. And so I find that when I pray the Rosary, as I say my Hail Marys, um, I sort of move around the image, around the statue, and it sort of engages me in a completely different way. It was quite unexpected, but engages me in a way that looking at uh, an oil painting 
or looking at a mosaic or a flat image just doesn't engage me in the same way. There's something very special about sculpture, I think. Um, again, in, in the book, you'll see in the second uh, Joyful Mystery, The Visitation, a beautiful white glazed terracotta uh, uh, sculpture of The Visitation um, by Della Robbia. And the, it's so tender, the faces, you know, so we do engage with sculpture in a particular way. And that's really very interesting because, of course, um, ortho orthodoxy still has a reticence about three-dimensional art like that. You know, icons are fine because they're flat, but having statues seems a step too far, too much of a graven image. Um, and yet it does engage us and help us to pray very powerfully, I think. Perhaps they're too powerful. I don't know. <laughs> I, I was really amazed by that, that Della Robbia image. Um, because initially I thought um, it was so kind of contemporary, it was so uh, um, it, it felt so modern. So they were they were people that you could see around today. Yeah. And I thought, oh, they, I wonder if that's if that's a, a modern image. And I looked at it; it's, it's what five five hundred years old, and yes. yet it speaks uh, across the centuries of, of that, as you said, of that kind of the tenderness of that moment. Yeah, it's great um, art, isn't it? Um, yeah, can do that. I suppose um, that's probably one of the few items of really great art, if you like, museum quality art, you mm. want to call it that, that's in the book. What My concentration has always been more on the sacred art that we see in our churches. Because as you say, sometimes they can be just thought of as just functional art, but it's not just functional. I mean, the function it serves is to point to another. That's why it's function, it doesn't draw attention to itself. It points to eternal truth, it points to the gospel, and when it does that, uh, when you're sort of reading it and contemplating theology with it, it's doing what it's meant to do. It's not meant to say, look at me. Uh, in the way that Gregorian chant, which is a great music of the church, does that. It meant, it's meant to uh, uh, highlight the sacred text, as the Second Vatican Council tells us, sacred music highlights the text, and that's what it's meant to do. When the music becomes overblown, for example, or the art becomes overblown, as you mentioned in contemporary art, where it sort of draws attention to itself and it says, you know, I'm here to shock you or to kind of evoke a feeling in you, I'm here to move you, then I think um, it, it doesn't suit um, the, the, the users of the church and the liturgy, certainly. And one I, of the things I liked very much um, uh, on, on a few of the images in, in the book is that you've you photograph them kind of in their context, you know, maybe with a candle, maybe with uh, some, some light falling on them from a, a, a nearby stained glass window. So they, they kind of help us to enter into that, that space in front of them, which yeah. is designed for prayer. Yes. Um, yes. That's, I mean, that's what I hope to do. And I, I really hope that people will, well, open their eyes and look at the stained glass windows in their church. Um, you know, not everyone is fortunate enough to have a church with lots of stained glass windows, but we do have many in our country. Um, and uh, there have been so many people who said to me that they've not really looked at the stained glass windows before. Uh, mm. So it's only after they've looked at my photographs that they say, oh, I didn't notice that I was there. Now, one of the most wonderful uh, opportunities I had recently um, when we were restoring the great apps of our church was to actually climb the scaffolding and go right up close to the stained glass windows. I was able to, you know, touch the windows. And this is like eight stories up in the air. And um, it was terrifying to go up, but once I, I, but I was determined to go because I thought, well, if I don't do this now, I'll never get this opportunity. Mm. And the detail in these windows is tremendous. For example, uh, there's a beautiful, so the, the stained glass windows I'm talking about has the 15th, mystery of the rosary the fifth glorious mystery that's our lady's coronation as queen christ is seated on the throne he's got a footstool and from below you don't really notice this but under his footstool is a little serpent's head it's the devil under his footstool and that's that line from psalm 109 you know um he will make my, put my enemies under his feet right and that's the enemy the enemy under the feet of christ that's his victory and our lady's sharing that because she's been crowned in heaven um, as it turns out, I mean, that's not the image I use uh, in the book, um, but in, in due course, in fact, I want to do a, a presentation for my parish just on the apps window 
and explain all the different symbols in there, who are the different saints that we see and so on and so forth, because the detail is astonishing. And I've now got it photographed up close and I can do a PowerPoint presentation for them. So moving on from the photography, I mean, I, I said earlier that you have this, um, this rather kind of unique position as promoter, promoter general of the Holy Rosary uh, for the order of uh, preachers. So can you tell us a bit about that particular hat that you wear and, and what uh, it entails? Yes, oh, well, um, I always say that the best promoter of the rosary, of course, is Our Lady. And um, I think Our Lady appeared in Lourdes and Fatima to promote the rosary uh, because the promoted general is doing such a bad job. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the rosary was given uh, according to tradition by Our Lady to St. Dominic. Certainly the rosary is the special heritage of the Dominican order and it's entrusted to us. So again, I often tell people that, you know, if you already pray the rosary and you love the rosary, joyful, sorrowful, glorious mysteries, then you already share in our Dominican spirituality in some way because um, it's so much and part of, of what it means to be a Dominican that we should pray the rosary and pray it every day. Um, my job as promoter general is to encourage um, my brothers and sisters in the Dominican order to pray and to preach the rosary. So I put together resources that will help them. And so it is my hope that this book as well will be an aid to their praying of the rosary and maybe to help them preach the rosary as well. Um, in addition, uh, there's this sort of mission ad extra. You know, the rosary becomes a wonderful bridge uh, uh, for the order to ordinary people who may not know Dominicans or Dominican life at all. And so uh, I find that the rosary is a wonderful way for us to uh, ext extend our mission to the world. And we do this principally through the rosary confraternity, one of the oldest and most indulgent confraternities in the church. And um, the confraternity is uh, ha really having a very special year this year, um, 2021. Uh, we'll say a bit more about that shortly. Um, but the confraternity is basically a spiritual union of all those who pray the rosary within the Dominican order. So you join the confraternity, you promise to say 15 decades of the rosary every week. That's all very light. Uh, and if you do that and you pray for the confraternity, you can be assured that there are people throughout the world, hundreds of thousands praying for you as well. And that makes us, you know, a beautiful spiritual union of people bound together in charity who are praying for one another whilst meditating on these mysteries of our salvation. So my job as rosary promoter is to, is to help the confraternity to grow and to encourage it to grow. And that's why, again, in this book, I do talk about the confraternity. I mentioned how you can join up and uh, I want to do what I can to encourage um, membership of the confraternity. I think, it, I think it's also a wonderful um, kind of, I wouldn't say kind of a joke, but uh, the, the providence gives to this order, which is famous for its, uh, its great intellects, Thomas Aquinas and everything, also the prayer of, of the simple uh, in the rosary. And uh, so, so that we don't, we don't have to be uh, a, a university studying theology to, to feel the, the Dominican influence. Yeah, well, I mean, the same order, the Dominican order also gave to the world um, the patron saint of artists. You know, blessed okay. Fra Angelico, John of Fiesole is his name in the order, but he's known by, as Fra Angelico. Um, Beato Angelico is the patron saint of artists. And I think it's very, therefore very fitting that we use sacred art and sacred images. Uh, and we have indeed for the fifth um, sorrowful mystery, the crucifixion, one of Fra Angelico's most famous frescoes of Christ crucified with our Holy Father Saint Dominic adoring the, the, at, uh, Christ at the foot of the cross, sort of adoring the precious blood of Christ. Um, that's a beautiful uh, image. Fra Angelico has so many. And in fact, um, there are many good rosary books uh, illustrated entirely with Fra Angelico's images. And we could have done that too, um, because it's so hard to choose a Fra Angelico image. But yes, the order is graced to have great mystics, um, great uh, practical, you might say practical saints like St. Martin de Porres, great defenders of, of justice, such as Bartolome de las Casas, um, and, you know, artists. I'll, I'll, I'll stop you there, you're just, you're just showing off now. <laughs> 
No, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I always, I always think of um, uh, Frangelico's uh, confres there, who had you know some of the the highest works of of the Renaissance there in the, in their uh, in their bedrooms, essentially in their cells. Yeah. Um, Have uh, you been to San Marco? In yes. The yeah. No, it's it's wonderful, isn't it? Amazing place. Yes. Uh, in a sense, it's kind of pity. It's 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 a museum, but it, but it, it's great to be able to kind of for for more people to be able to see the the art yes. in situ. Um, <laughs> So yeah, we were we were saying oh, this is quite a special year in which to to publish a book on the rosary. Do you want to tell us a bit and um, why why that is? Yes, well, uh, twenty twenty one is the four hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the fee, uh, of the institution of the feast of the Holy Rosary, because as you may know, of course, seventh of October in fifteen twenty one was the Battle of Lepanto. Is that right? No, sorry, fifteen seven. 1571, right. Battle of Lepanto. Yes, and 7th of October, um, that's the feast that we now call the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. Um, but at the time, uh, what happened? There was a great battle at Lepanto, which really uh, was crucial in order to safeguard salvation for Europe, safeguard the civilization of love and of life. And Our Lady intervened. Um, through the work of a Dominican Pope, Pius V, St. Pius V, who asked the Rosary Confraternity based in Rome and throughout Europe to pray, to pray the Rosary for victory. And they did. And he gave the victory to Our Lady. He attributed it to Our Lady and he named it the Feast of Our Lady of Victories at first. Very soon it was changed into the Feast of the Holy Rosary, which is a beautiful title given to it. Until more recently in our time in the 20th century, Our Lady appeared at Fatima, of course, where she famously told the children, the, the saintly visionaries, that her name was Our Lady of the Rosary. And so I think it's right and fitting as well that in the 20th century, um, that feast day, the 7th of October, should have its name changed ever so slightly from the Feast of the Holy Rosary to the Feast of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary. Um, whatever it's called, it's a significant year, 450 years, for 50 years of that feast. Um, it's also the 800th anniversary of the Dies Natalis, that is the heavenly birthday of our Holy Father Dominic. He died in Bologna on the 6th of August in uh, 1221. And it's also at the same time, the 800th anniversary of the coming of the Dominican friars to England. One of the last things St. Dominic did before he died was to send 13 friars to England, specifically to Oxford. They arrived in Oxford, we know, on the 15th of August, the Feast of the Assumption in 1221. But the date when they landed on the shores of England was the day that St. Dominic died, the 6th of August, what we now call the Transfiguration. And our friars, four of them, uh, you might have seen perhaps online, they mm. recently traced the, uh, the pilgrimage, as they call it, of those first 13 friars, and they walked from Ramsgate uh, all the way to Oxford over the course of two weeks, which is a wonderful uh, way to live the Dominican life, walking and praying as you go. And of course, what did they take with them? What did they pray? The rosary. The rosary is this perfect mobile praying device used by itinerant mendicant friars. And it still is, it's still used that way. And I, as, promoter, as promoter general, I was just so happy and so proud of my brothers who prayed the rosary with a whole bunch of people who walked with them. Uh, they had different people walking with them every day. And of course they prayed for all the various intentions that were entrusted to them that were being emailed into our website for them. And I think that's what the rosary is for. The rosary is a great tool to preach the gospel and to keep us to united in prayer, united in the love of Jesus and Mary. Indeed. So, um, Father, I just wanted to really say how how happy we we have been to collaborate with you on on this uh, on this book. And um, looking over the designs, I think um, I was I was saying. Um, that we published over 7,000 books in the CTS's uh, um, 150 year history. Um, uh, but I, I can truly say that I think this is one of the most beautiful books that we've, we've published in that century and a half. 
Uh, the images are wonderful. Um, the reflections that you've written are, have been extremely inspiring. And there's lots of other kind of goodies in there. Um, the, the introduction by the, the Master General of the, of the Order is, is wonderful. There's prayers at the back uh, of the book as well. And so I think this is going to be an absolutely wonderful gift for, for anyone this, uh, this, uh, this, during this coming month of the Rosary and leading up to Christmas, um, because I think it's, it's, it's one of those books that you can pick up, go back to, leaf through, really enjoy, pray with. Um, so yeah, I mean, I must say it's it's been it's been wonderful to work with you on that, and we're really looking forward to seeing it in the flesh. Oh, so, oh thank you very much. Um, I, it really has been a tremendous honor to to hear you say that. Also, just as you say, to be part of this 150 year history of the CTS and its great lineup of, of authors. Um, you know, one's not fit to untie the sandals of many of these people, but um, I. I couldn't be more delighted with the finished product. I haven't seen it in the, you know, in the flesh, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted from the outset, and I think I told you this from the beginning, that we should pay attention to the graphic design, that it should look elegant and contemporary and yet, you know, classic. Um, it mustn't be gimmicky, but beautiful. Beauty is such an important uh, element, I think, that we must have in our in our world, which is all too ugly, I think, as you said about contemporary art and so on. So that was my basic brief. And so I'm just delighted uh, with the graphic artist, Amelia, for the work that she did. Um, thank you so much to Victoria as well, and to yourself, um, who have helped me along the way. And um, yeah, thank you for this beautiful book. And I know that people around the world uh, will enjoy it when it's out. Um, for once, the UK is ahead of the US. Um, actually, a number of my US friends have already bought several copies from the, from the UK, um, from the CTS uh, bookshop. So uh, it, it, they will get it early, birds will get it there. Um, Indeed, it, it'll, be, it'll be with us in the next couple of weeks in good time for the month of, of the Rosary. And uh, Ignatius Press will be uh, picking the book up and, and distributing it um, in the uh, the states in the new year. So, um, Father, just uh, how can people connect with you? Um, in on you have quite a following on social media. Where can people where can people uh, find you there? Well, you know, you can't escape the uh, the eye of Sauron or <laughs> rather Google. Uh, so, if you Google uh, Lawrence Liu or Lawrence O P, Lawrence with a W. Uh, I'm sure you'll find my Facebook, my Twitter, my Instagram, uh, and what else am I on? Flickr, <laughs> of yeah. course. Yeah, so uh, I'm always very happy to, uh, to try and connect with people. I, I can't promise I answer all messages, but you know, if there's a real cry for help, I do, I do answer, I do pray for you. Um, and it was through social media that I met my first friends in Oxford who taught me how to use the camera properly. So I'm totally indebted to, to this new technology, this new way of connecting to people. Um, and, and I hope that, uh, I don't know when this podcast is gonna be out, but if people hear this and they want to come to the book launch, uh, come to the Rosary Shrine, St. Dominic's Priory in London, um, in Northwest London, and uh, we're launching the book, I believe, on the 7th of October, the Feast of the Holy Rosary, on the 450th anniversary day of Lepanto. It'll be really exciting. Mass at six o'clock, followed by uh, a little book launch and reception inside the cloister of the Dominican Priory. So that's a rare opportunity to go inside uh, where we live. Um, Wonderful. Forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. For... So if, if uh, you could just uh, give us your blessing and we'll, we'll bring the podcast to an end. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And may Our Lady of the Holy Rosary and our Holy Father Dominic pray for us. Okay. Thank you.